Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here today to talk to you about the microdiscectomy. This is a procedure performed through your back to help remove pressure off of your nerves. If you have severe compression of your nerves in your lower back, you may be experiencing symptoms of discomfort, particularly in your buttocks and hamstrings, but it can even go all the way down to your calves and feet. In this video, we will be discussing the normal anatomy of your lower back, as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure. At the end of this video, I'll discuss risks, expected recovery, as well as any post-operative restrictions. If you want to skip around to different sections of this video, please see the timestamps in the description below to find the parts you want to learn about the most. Now that we have an overview of the video, let's get started. Okay, now that we're here, let's discuss the microdiscectomy. Before we get started though, we should have a better understanding of what the normal anatomy looks like in your lower back. This is a particular view as if we're looking at you from your back in. So this is going to be your lumbar vertebrae. We're going to be looking at a few of the anatomic landmarks that are important. The first of which being the spinous process. This is the bone that juts out from your vertebrae that you can actually feel when you're touching your back. Coming down from the spinous process is what's called the lamina. The lamina is the bony covering that is on top of your spinal canal. The lamina protects the spine and nerves underneath. Underneath the lamina is going to be a protective covering, which is a ligament called the ligamentum flavum. This helps protect your spinal canal. Below the ligamentum flavum and inside of your spinal canal is actually going to be the dura. The dura, you can imagine, is a long balloon that begins from the base of your skull and goes all the way down to your lower back. Inside of the dura contains spinal fluid as well as your nerve rootlets. Lastly, the connection between the bones in the lower back are going to be called the facet joints. These are the areas where your bones connect. So if you could imagine, if we call this bone your lumbar fourth vertebrae or L4, and this bone is going to be your lumbar fifth vertebrae or L5, the connection between these bones is going to be at this joint here on the left and on the right. These facet joints help you maintain your motion and flexibility. Let's now move on to what the view of these same structures would look like from the top. This is again a top view or a cross section where if we cut you in half, this is what we're looking at. So to orient you, up top here is going to be where the skin of your back is and way down at the bottom is going to be where the front of your body is. So going over those anatomic landmarks that we looked at previously, the spinous process is going to be in red. Remember again, the very tip of this spinous process is the bone you can actually feel when you're touching your lower back. Coming down from the spinous process is going to be the lamina. And the facet joints, which are the connections between adjacent vertebrae, are highlighted here in black. This is a joint just like any other joint that you would have in your body, like your knee or your hip. It helps connect two bones together so that you could have motion. Directly underneath the lamina is going to be that protective ligamentous covering that covers the spinal canal. That's the ligamentum flavum highlighted here in green. Beneath the ligamentum flavum is going to be that protective covering that helps protect your nerve rootlets, which are highlighted here in purple. So again, the dura is that long balloon that we're just seeing in cross-section here that protects the nerve rootlets which are inside. This white that's between the nerve rootlets and the edge of the dura is going to be spinal fluid, which basically gives nutrients to the nerves within the lower back. Lastly, the disc is highlighted here in black. Our topic today is how do we treat a disc herniation? But what exactly does a disc herniation look like from this top view or this cross-section view? Remember again, the skin of your back is up top, the front of your body is going to be down below, and your disc is going to be here, with your nerve rootlets and spinal canal highlighted here in black. When you have a disc herniation though, part of that disc material ends up escaping the protective covering that holds the disc in together between your vertebrae. When that occurs, you get compression of the nerve rootlets within the dura, and this can cause pain and discomfort for people. How does this look like in a real person though? Imagine this same cross-section view when you're cut in half. And what ends up happening is part of this disc material ends up coming out from the protective covering that holds the disc in. You can see on this view how the dura is much more deformed on this side than it is on this side. As a result of this, 
these nerve rootlets are compressed, and that's what can cause discomfort for people. Where is the incision if we perform this procedure? Usually you're going to have about a half inch incision or less within your lower back. This is highlighted here in black. Let's go ahead and go step by step how I perform this procedure. The first step is going to be what's called a laminotomy. This simply means removal of bone. The strategy here is that we have to remove the bone enough so that we can see the ligamentum flavum. We have to see the entirety of the ligamentum flavum to be able to do this procedure correctly because we know that underneath the ligamentum flavum is going to be where our nerve rootlets and dura are. That's going to be our target to view. So our goal is we need to remove this section of bone in the top or cross section view and we have to remove this section of bone when you're looking at it through the back. How do we do that? Well, we use a high speed drill. And what that drill does is we end up drilling very carefully in those particular areas that are highlighted here in red. And what ends up happening is when those bones are removed, we're able to see the entirety of the ligamentum flavum on the side where you have your pain. After the laminotomy is performed, we need to identify the ligamentum flavum, which is highlighted here in red. This is the protective covering that's on top of the dura that needs to be removed before we can identify the nerves or where your disc herniation is. This is the last protective covering before we get to the areas that we need to be very concerned about. After we've identified the ligamentum flavum and made our laminotomy or hole within the bone, our next step is to remove the ligamentum flavum. How do we remove the ligamentum flavum safely though? I use this special instrument called a kerosene. This instrument allows me to remove the ligamentum flavum safely. What we've done here is we took a little bit of the top part of the ligamentum flavum, as you can see here, and that's usually where I like to start. After we remove that top part, I then like to remove the bottom and then the part in the middle, which leaves this kind of sheet here. And this sheet can easily be lifted so that we can expose the entirety of the dura and possibly some of your disc herniation, as you can see here. So now at this point, we have removed the entirety of the ligamentum flavum. And now we have our disc herniation here. Are you able to see it? This is going to be our disc herniation highlighted here in green. Now the green circle is where the disc herniation is and the red is identifying where the disc herniation actually is. This green circle over here is also showing the disc herniation in the top view. After we've identified the disc herniation, removed the ligamentum flavum as well as the bone covering it, we need to place a retractor to move the dangerous stuff out of the way so that we can identify the disc herniation and remove it. You can see here that this disc herniation is going to be completely covered by this dura if you're looking down. So what we need to do is we need to place something here to move this dura over to the side so that we're able to identify and safely visualize the disc herniation. We will use this special kind of retractor here. So what we'll do is I'll have my assistant place this in and what that does is it moves the dura away from the disc herniation so that we're looking right at it. This is best represented in this top view over here. With this retractor in place, the dura is moved completely over to the side so that we have a straight shot to look at where the disc herniation is. This is also represented here on the view directly from your back where we have the retractor in place moving the dura over to the side which contains the nerve rootlets so we have a clear angle to where the disc herniation is. After we have the dura protected and the nerve rootlets protected, we then use this instrument called a pituitary. We then take this pituitary and we then pluck out the disc herniation. Once we have removed enough of the disc herniation, we then remove our retractors and the thecal sac or the dura goes back to where it should have been. Pay attention now to the top view here on the left. After the disc herniation and the retractors have been removed now, there's no undue compression within the nerve rootlets or on the dura. There's nothing compressing these nerves anymore. Let's take a look at a before and after view now. You can see here that the disc herniation is causing severe compression of these nerve rootlets. However, after, you can see that there is no compression of those nerve rootlets. We were able to do this all through a very small hole within your bone here. This hole is only about the size of your thumbnail. Here's another look at the before and after, this time from the back view. The disc herniation is highlighted here in green, and then afterwards there's no undue compression of the nerve roots. 
all the pressure has been removed at this point. One last thing is to take a look at the amount of bone that we had to remove to safely remove this disc herniation. Looking here at the top view, highlighted here with my laser pointer, this is about the amount of bone that we have to remove to do this procedure safely. Compare it to this other side, which has been untouched. It's only about this much bone, and that much bone, again, amounts to about the size of your thumbnail. And that's step-by-step -step how I perform the microdiscectomy. Now that I've described step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure, what are the risks? Infection is a risk that we worry about with any sort of procedure where we have to make an incision. Because the incision is so small, the risk is very low for this, way under 1%. Patients who have an increased risk of infection tend to be those who are obese, diabetic, or are smokers. If you have one of these conditions, we do talk to you about it beforehand to let you know about this slightly increased risk. Next is really the only thing that I worry about during the surgery, and that's getting a hole within that fluid-filled sac that holds your spine and nerves. That's your dura. If there's a hole in the dura, some of that spinal fluid can leak out. If it leaks out, it's something that we need to repair. Sometimes we're able to put a stitch in it to repair it just like we would a leaky balloon. Other times we have to patch it. If that has to happen, we may have to keep you in the hospital for a day or two to make sure that it's not continuing to leak. If a spinal fluid leak does happen during surgery and it is repaired, there's about a 10% chance that we do have to bring you back to the operating room to fix it again. This is exceedingly rare. Frequently patients ask me, will this happen again to me? What we do know is that patients who do have disc herniations have about a 10% lifetime risk of it happening again. Those who are at increased risk for reherniation or reoperation tend to be those who are younger, male, work labor jobs, or are smokers. Nerve injury is again a very rare risk that can happen. Sometimes because of scarring, the nerve looks so much like the disc that we're unable to really tell the difference. This is in very rare cases, and in those very rare cases, the nerve root may be injured. Nerve injury is a risk that could happen. Persistent pain may also occur. This may be due to some permanent nerve damage which may have occurred because of the nerve being compressed for so long. The job of the surgeon is to remove the compression on the nerve. Unfortunately, today we can't fix a permanently damaged nerve. While you will see significant improvements, you may still have a little bit of pain or numbness and tingling following this procedure. What is the recovery like? This is done as an outpatient, meaning you come in and you leave a few hours later. You may have some mild back pain because of the incision as well as our retractors putting pressure on your muscles, but this quickly subsides after about a month. The thing that I cannot stress the most is that it takes about one year for your nerves to fully heal. The one thing I always try to tell my patients and stress to them is that nerves take about one year to fully heal. As a surgeon, when we removed compression upon your nerve, that allows your body to now go through the healing process to fix any damage that's happened to the nerve. During the first six weeks in particular, you may have some good days with that nerve, you may also have some bad days with that nerve. You just have to let the dust settle from surgery. After those six weeks though, you largely should be feeling much better, but you may also have some ups and downs over the course of the next year. But how you feel at one year is going to be how you feel long term. Some symptoms take a lot longer to get better. Things like weakness and numbness and tingling tend to take a long time to get better if they do get better. But patients tend to tolerate things like numbness and tingling a little bit better than they do severe pain, which does respond fairly quickly following surgery. The last question I usually go over is what can I do post-op? When you go home, you're going to have a small bandage that's going to be over your incision. Underneath that bandage is going to be some butterfly strips which help keep the incision closed and all the stitches are on the inside. So after the third day after surgery, you can remove that bandage and shower normally. Simply let soap and water run down their back and then pat it dry afterwards. Probably put a new bandage over the incision for about the first week after surgery because it may rub on your pant line. After about one week, if those butterfly strips haven't fallen off on their own, it is okay to pull them off yourself. After one week though, you may not even have to cover the incision anymore. From a restriction standpoint, we say no bending, twisting, or lifting greater than 20 pounds for six weeks. This is because that small hole within the disc where that disc herniated out and we had to pluck it out takes about six weeks to fully scar over. 
During this time period, we don't want you doing anything strenuous because we don't want more disc material to come out of the back. After six weeks, you can return to any activity that you were previously doing. Some people ask, do I need physical therapy after? We make that determination at the six-week follow-up visit to see how you're doing. The vast majority of patients are doing so well at that time that they really don't need physical therapy. During those six weeks though, it is okay for you to walk as much as you would like. Remember, you're going to have some mild lower back pain and some days with your leg are going to be good and other days may not be so good. Just listen to your body. The more you walk though, the more you will remake those connections that may have been lost between your brain and your leg. From a pain management standpoint, we like to stress the use of over-the-counter medication. I generally tell patients to take two extra strength Tylenol three times a day. That's 1000 milligrams of Tylenol for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In between those meals, you can take ibuprofen 600 milligrams. What that allows you to do is take alternating Tylenol and ibuprofen six times a day which may give you a great background effect of pain relief so that you don't have to take as much prescription pain medication or a muscle relaxer. Generally though, my patients are not taking prescription pain medication for more than a week or two. I hope this gave you a good overview of frequently asked questions. And there you have it, the microdiscectomy. Hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of the normal anatomy of the lower back as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure and what to expect postoperatively. If you're curious about conditions that can be treated with this particular procedure, please see the links in the description below. To have a consultation with me regarding your spine, you can call our office phone number also found below, or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. If you'd like, you can also follow me on these other platforms here. And if you're on YouTube, Please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about other future educational videos such as these. Take care.